935 K-Day. 90s hip hop back in the day. I go by the name of Noah Ayala. In the studio. Can I can I use the word kingpin? Uh... Can I use the word legend? <laughs> can I use the word the black cocaine cowboy? Uh... Um, it's an honor, man. Especially, you know, I just don't want to celebrate the fuck shit. I think it's also important that we equally uh take note and celebrate what you've transformed into and what you're doing currently. No doubt, no um, doubt. But, but without in the, the studio, history, without the history, the new don't mean nothing. You know, freeway Ricky Ross. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Yes, yes. This man has probably spent more than you've ever made in your life in one week. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Freeway Ricky Ross, you're from L.A., right? Yeah, yeah. I was raised. I, my mom moved here in, in, in uh, like, 63. So uh, I've been living here since 63, except the time I did in prison. You know, you know. Right. We're going to get into that, though. <laughs> but I want people that may not be... Super familiar to kind of, you know, know your story, know how you grew up where and, and, been, and where man. it went. Where, they, where you been? Stop it. So three years old, you come to Los Angeles, right? Yeah. What right was growing up? Watch uh, riot. I was got it right before the Watch Riot. Oh. The Watch Riot hit right when we was here. And uh, it was a new experience for me, man, to see uh, the military riding down the streets. I come from a small town in Texas, you know, where, right. where they didn't have neighbors. You know, your neighbor might have stayed 10 miles away, so you didn't see other people too often. Oh, all of a sudden chickens. you come to this city. You play with cows and chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that like, uh, you know, just growing up in what part of L.A. again? South Central. I've been living in South Central all my life. Okay. Uh, when we first moved here, we stayed on Vernon and Broadway. And uh, we moved from there to Watts for a little while. And uh, then we eventually settled on 87 and Figueroa, you know, where I've been staying, you know, ever since, you know. That's why I got my nickname, the Freeway, 110, right. baby. So, Y'all know what the 110 is? That <laughs> oh, I feel like we have a major talk right now, like that that big key talk we having right now. Um, nah, so between the time you moved to LA and to the time you started getting involved with like the street life and selling drugs, uh, what was what was your upbringing like? What was your teenage years like? Man, your I childhood? watched LA come from from no gangs to 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 gangs to the PCP, uh, cocaine. You know, I watched the whole transformation. I, I lived through it. You know, right. what I'm saying I, I was. I was old enough to remember Tookie Williams, you know, when when the Crips started uh, uh, taking off. I knew Big Puddin' personally. I knew uh, Terry Cadeau. I knew Terry Carter. So I, I was right in that age where I was uh, able to experience uh, a lot of the things that um, people now just talk about. Right. So, okay. What's, what's the thing that triggers, I guess, you getting into the drug trade, selling cocaine? Well, well, and what was the what was the atmosphere like at that time? It's crazy, because I always hear people say there's there was life <laughs> before cocaine and crack, and life after, and it was just somebody hit a switch. Man, we we writing it, we we tightening up the movie script right now, and we just talked about that. And, and uh, boy, uh, what triggered the, me getting into the? It, it, it's a lot of factors, mm. but one of the most important, I believe, that that hindered me from uh, venturing into other avenues and, and kind of locked me in a box was my inability to be able to read and write. Mm. But, uh, you know, the movie's going to show uh, that as well. But then it, it's another factor that uh, my man said that uh, kicked the whole thing off. But I, I can't let it out the box because he might be mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but like, I what want was, to, though. What was like that? I mean, like, what what was, like, the, the early days like? Like, you get into the drug trade, uh... I know you just didn't start as like Freeway Ricky Ross, you know what oh, I mean? Oh no, no, no! I start off, man. I I was the poorest dude at school. You know, mm. when I was going to school, uh, I was so poor. Matter of fact, my 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 first week in prison, one of my junior high school partners ran into me. We in prison. He was like, "Man, they told me it was you, and I couldn't believe it." <laughs> He said, man, you used to tape tennis balls to the bottom of your shoe, and, and everybody knew you and your brother swapped out pants. Y'all thought that didn't nobody <laughs> know. We, jokes. Yeah, we all knew. And uh, I thought about what he was saying, and, and everything he said was 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 real. Uh, but, you know, I, I started off, I found uh, I found what I, what I thought was my niche. You know, I've been looking for a niche in life. Uh, right. My inability to be able to read didn't allow me to get a normal job, uh, 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 so I was shut out of that. And that made me turn to the streets. 
mm. from stealing cars. I start off stealing cars. Uh, I remember the first time, man, I went to the street races, you know, when, when, when I started seeing, you know, like the, the, the Terry Cadeau, the Terry Carters, and it was my first time really seeing the Crips and the Bloods intermingle and, 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 uh, um, uh, they weren't fighting at that time. You know, it was like, who got the best car? You know, the Bloods okay. pull up. We got the best cars. The Crips pull up. We got the best cars. And and when I see it, I was like, man, I want one of them cars. <laughs> <laughs> I like nice things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that's just some of the history, you know what I'm saying? And, and some of the stuff that the movie's going to be touching on and right. some of the stuff that the, uh, the, the, the book touches on. And from that... I started going around asking all those guys, how did you get that car, man? What, what did you do to get that car? And and, and it's funny, you know, uh, the other day, the guy who who first took me out stealing cars, you know, Dirty Benny, he come huh. by my shop the other day. What up, Dirty Benny? <laughs> what up, Benny? <laughs> and uh, when I asked him, he was like, come on, I'll show you how we getting them. You know, mm. I was like 18, 18 years old, just fresh out of high school. And I'm assuming back, did, okay, did you... uh? You said you did a little bit of car theft, but did you just go straight to cocaine? Or was there some, like, weed or something in between? No, or? no, I went from from cars to cocaine. Well, the cars Ooh. is really how I got introduced to the cocaine, um, from messing with cars. So the cars introduced me to a guy that painted cars, and mm-hmm. he eventually was the guy that, that, that showed me cocaine for the first time. Now, I heard you say uh, in another interview there was times when you were like at the height of like your career per se, that you were going through like three million dollars a week, not spending three million, no, but actually a day. take it a day. Yeah, a day. yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I, I apologize. I you know what I, I mean? Let me put some speck yeah, on this yeah, man's yeah, name. Yeah. Three million dollars cash a day. No, we used to do. We we we. Our last two years, we were doing a million dollars every single day. I mean, how do you even count that? You get girls and 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 a couple money machines. And yeah. they sit there all day. You make them walk around naked like the <laughs> no. movies? <laughs> I saw that in Blow. No, nah, no, nah, we didn't do that. Uh, uh, we we more c- c- civilized. All right, you just got to make people. sure, girl, you can't be, you know, we trying to about, steal we, some ones. I mean, you know, when you're having money like that, you don't really be worried about people right. stealing from you. I mean, you make so much money, and it's coming in so fast. You know, money's always falling on the floor, so, you know, somebody's going to pick right. some up. And, and, you know, you don't sweat the small things. And back then, cocaine was, like, fashionable, wasn't it? It was. It was. And that's how I got drew into it because I had never saw addiction. You know, I was only 18 years old. I never right. saw addiction. What, what is addiction? You tell me what addiction is. I didn't know, you know. Mm-hmm. And I had never watched the news. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like one of these kids right now. Like, a lot of so many of our kids are walking around. Yeah, I around can only imagine when I was and, 18 and, and, if and I... The you, dumb shit I would do if I had money like that. You know what I mean? So when before you get the money, you know, just the the the, the just the, the mentality, the, the part of not knowing, you know, but thinking you know, mm-hmm. but not really knowing. You know, uh, our kids they think they're smart than us. They're twelve years old. They can tell you everything. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like Dad, I seen all that already. What, what is you talking about, Dad? You old school. You don't know nothing. That stuff you talking about, that that ain't you know it ain't it no more. So um, I, I I went through that same phase. Right. What's that like, though? I mean, you're a teenager. You got that much cash. You you you're doing all these things. Well, I, I didn't really make much money as a teenager. My my money. It took me a few months to learn the business. You know, you, you can't make no money if you don't know the business. Right. And and uh, well, let me ask you this: then. What at a young age made you look at what the people at the time were doing when they were selling drugs, and what was going through your head to say, "Hey," because you're a brilliant business person. And I actually had Gary Vee in here before he talked to you, and we were talking about you. Yeah, so I'll tell <laughs> oh, you Gary about that. Oh, Gary talked about me yeah. before I went and met him? Okay, so we're talking in the interview, right? And yeah. one of the things I told Gary Vee, I was like, uh, I think our audience has the most to gain from our from our interview together because, you know, our, our audience is the hood. It's uh, right, right. it's Watts, it's Compton, it's out there in the IE, San Bernardino. Like, and I was like, so, but I feel like these people got the most raw skills and the entrepreneurial spirit to yeah, really make it yeah, happen. And yeah. then I, was, I brought you up. I was like, in my opinion, Freeway Ricky Ross, he was a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. You might be the one that got me that interview with Gary. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he told me during the interview, he's like, I'm not, you know, it's funny you bring him up. I'm about to go see him next after this. So, yeah, man. So Yeah, yeah. And you're but, so right. And, 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 and Gary gives so much hope, you know, with, with his words mm-hmm. of, of, of wisdom, which I call it, because uh, when we talked, he talked about being a psychologist, how to to analyze people, how to judge people. And, right. Uh, in the game, you have to be good at that. Yeah. So uh, uh, You don't know who's lying to you, who's telling you the truth. Nah, or... nah. It, it's a total throw-off. So um, 
Gary says what what I be thinking, man. Right. I mean, when I sit down and talk to him, I was just I was just mesmerized by how well he understood uh, uh, the drug business. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Even though he's never sold drugs, but he understands it. Because at the end of the day, honestly, I think business is business, and it's cutthroat, no matter it what is. industry it you're is. in. You know, it is. It is. And and it's unfortunate that so many of our kids in the ghetto uh, get caught in this box. Because what I believe is that we allow our environment to to mold us into becoming who our community believes that we should be. Right. You know, and and a lot of that comes from who you hanging out with. You know uh, what your financial status is, what your back educational background is. All that plays a part in. Uh, you becing who you become, right? Even even just knowing something's actually possible. Yeah, and that's one. A lot of thing. our kids don't think that it's even yeah. possible. And so like, I give my mom credit on that. That's the one thing. Like you know, we didn't have a lot, but she let me know that like anything's possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so. important. That's important because even though my mom was a good person, she never told me that it was right. possible. You know, she never. It never even crossed her mind to talk to me about being successful. You mm-hmm. know, uh, her thing was to go to church, praise God, everything gonna be okay. And, and, you know, that's not true. Right, right. Um, I got a question for you. When you, uh, being someone who's lived that lifestyle and you sit back, and uh, these are all rappers that I'm fans of, by the way, like big fans of, uh, but I would love to know your opinion. Like when you hear like a Pusha T, when you hear a, a young Jeezy, even somebody that I know you don't see eye to eye with, like a Rick Ross, and you hear him telling these stories, whether real or fake, like what's your take on that? Well, you know, those stories are really dangerous to, 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 to society, I mean, in, in, in some ways, because a lot of our young people, like me, I saw the movie Superfly. And when I left that theater, Arthur Ashe was no longer my hero. I had a new hero. So with, with the music that our guys are rapping, and I know why they rap it, too. Right. Uh, our young people hear that, and our young people think that you can go out and sell cocaine and parlay that into a record career like so many of our other heroes. Because these guys are really heroes, whether they like it or whether anybody like it. People oh, look yeah. people look up to these guys. Yeah, I'm one of those, you know, kids. People that grew follow up people follow the their 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 path, their words. A lot of people get their wisdom from uh uh what they hear these rappers saying. So um it, it's 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 really critical that we get our young people to understand that, you know, there is no record deal at the end of the rainbow. You know, more than likely you're going to be in prison. Uh, uh, and if worst case scenario, you could be dead. Right. Uh, but then on, 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 on their part and, and, and to defend the rappers is that most of them, when they come up in the community, their first hero is a drug dealer. So, you know, I know, I know all the, right. everybody except the rapper who, who took my name, uh, uh, I have a you know somewhat of an acquaintance with them, mm-hmm. so I've spoke to them and we've talked, and and I understand where they're coming from. Right now, what's up with you and Rick Ross, man? Is that ever gonna get resolved, or is it just kind of just like what it is at this point? Because I don't know I mean, why he don't like me. I mean, he loved he me. He did though. steal your name. He loved me though. He don't like me, but he loved me. You know, one of those relationships where you like, I hate, I hate, I hate her, but I love her at the same time. You know, so I I, I don't know. Maybe one day, you know, uh. uh when he feel that me and him are looking eye to eye, you know, right. when when I'm on his level, you know, probably once I go up and and get an Oscar award or something like that there, and you know, uh, uh, capture the heavyweight title of the world, and and my man is killing the mm-hmm. radio station, then he'll probably reach out and say, you know what, I've been wrong about you all the time. Uh, but is know, it like that though? Does he feel a certain way about you? Think well, you know what? Just like I, a- I just got to go by what his friends say. You know, we, I was on Drink Champs uh, a couple couple weeks back with Nori, and mm-hmm. you know, and and they all come up with their own scenario because they defending right. his 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 attitude. You know, by not uh, uh, formally coming and and sitting down and talking to me and and maybe see if we could come because really what we did is is we got a business relationship. That that I'm not benefiting from, right? You know, because him using my name as a business. It, I so should, didn't you go to what happened with that? Because didn't you go to court I with that? And court. then I lost in court. You know, they they. But isn't that like your likeness and your name and like your it, image? It was it was, it, it, it was a tricky situation. The judge had the right to say that this record, his the first time his record came on a radio station in the country, mm-hmm. is what she had to judge. Was the public aware at that time, was the general public, meaning in L.A., that they know that this guy was using my name? 
So she took that day as the day that the the, 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 the time started. You have two. I had two years to, to, to find out that he was using my name and then do something about it. Well, I didn't do it until I got out of prison, right. which was five days late. Damn. So if she could have said, well, you know, the first day that they played him on the radio or the second or the first, up until the fifth day, nobody knew who he was. It was mm-hmm. the fifth day that they found out that everybody should have knew who he was. And this was this little small radio station in Miami, too. So she could have picked any date that she wanted to say uh, what day the general public should have known. Uh, but had I won that lawsuit, Universal and Warner Brothers and uh, Sony would have owed me like $50 million. Ooh. So. And you're going to get some, some powerful corporations. And they yeah, were not I trying to see have them. That. You know, they coming in there with 15 lawyers. I got yeah. I got my two little lawyers. You know what I'm saying? That I ain't paying, you know, because I'm fresh out of jail. I didn't really have no money either. Right. You know, I, I, was, I was struggling at the time. Uh, so so the judge, you know, she sided she side with the power, which, you know, is normal. So when you go into jail, I'm assuming you're at the height of your your career in selling drugs no right? i stopped selling drugs before i went to jail oh so what made you stop selling cocaine well, or I, I crack at to, this point I, right i started to see the hypocriteness in myself you know where i would tell you if you was one of my little homies i would go to you and say oh, you know man, don't sell mom no crack because mm, you started to see now at this point you're starting to see what it's my doing girl, to people. You know, i don't want to use it no more back up off her so I started to see myself being a hypocrite mm-hmm. of me not wanting my loved ones on crack, but then I'm willing to sell crack to everybody. So uh, when when I started to feel like that, um, I knew that I had to quit. Right. And that's what stopped me, not jail. Like a lot yeah. of people think because you go to jail. and I, Nah, jail don't stop you. You know, it'd be like, oh, no, nah, I'm going to come out here and do this better. <laughs> you bring up a great point that I want to get into. First of all, let me say, this man uh, has two books out. The latest one is 21 Keys. Sold I need a out. copy of that. Sold I know out. it's sold out. I sold need a copy. <laughs> I'm trying to get these keys. Y'all I like the, the double entendre, the 21 hey. Keys. Yes. Um, I'm going to get you one, though. As soon as, soon as my new uh, uh, print come in, right. you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure I come down and leave you one at the front desk. Uh, One of the side stories I think that's so interesting to your story is because were you the first one on the West Coast to be selling cocaine? No, uh, uh-uh. I, I. But you were I, definitely one of the one of the first, though, right? LA Times says that I was the first mass marketer mm. of cocaine. That there was other people who were selling it, but they were, you know, messing and peddling around. Right. And what I did when I started, I started to to study the the game, mm-hmm. and and I didn't want to be just a peddling around. I wanted to be the best, and, and that's <laughs> what I went for. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing that bugged my mind is that. Somehow the government's in, somehow the government is actually supplying you at this point, right? With yeah. like Reagan and the Iran Contra yeah, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Somehow I got hooked up with that crew. <laughs> so, so explain this to me because from my research and what I heard, it's like, uh, you're actually getting your product off the planes that were flying from Nicaragua. Yeah. Well, my guy, my supplier, he was a Nicaraguan. He was mm-hmm. the minister of agriculture from Nicaragua. Well, so he was we, in the government there. He was in the government. So when the Sandinistas uh, ran them out and America sent the planes over and everything to get all of them out mm-hmm. and brought them over here, well, they decided that America wasn't giving them enough money. So when he testified, you know, because he also was the guy who testified against me in, in court. Oh, wow. The same guy who was giving me the drugs was the guy who took me to the police. Who was a government worker for yeah, that country. And turned me in <sighs> to the FBI and DEA. So when he testified Damn. in court... He, he testified that, that Reagan and them gave him $18 million, but it wasn't enough to fight a war. So they figured that they could take that $18 million and turn it into 40 or $50 million, and then we closer to where we need to be mm-hmm. now, which which is understandable. And, and, and that's how they got started, basically. And, and somehow I got caught up in that web. <sighs> so think about how fucked up this is, guys. So the government puts drugs in our communities to fund a civil war in another country because they got beef with another country. Absolutely. And you got caught up in the middle. I got caught up in the middle. Not just me, man. Hundreds of yeah. thousands of of, 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 of uh, black and brown brothers is, is caught up in it, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons right now we're pushing this social equity with the marijuana here in, in, in L.A. because um, – Black and brown been the one who paid the bulk of the price for all this stuff to yep. to, to 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 be where it's at today. You know, had we not went to prison and 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 kept pushing 
issues that everybody else thought was insane and 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 we wouldn't be where we at right now today with, with legal yeah. marijuana. Yeah, so it's like country. we all took the hit and now all these other people want to come in and like we're And they're getting all the money yeah. now, you know. Uh, it's crazy, you know. Uh, it's like 98% of the people inside of the legal marijuana business are white. <laughs> Why is that? With, with all the black and brown they, people they the got one the who money. took the hit they for got, it, yeah. You know, when, when, when they legalized it, they put, they put, uh, they put numbers on like. Yeah. I could have never gotten a cocaine business had it been the way they did the marijuana business, mm-hmm. you know. Oh, if you want to get a license, you need 100000 Yeah, and who who's going to be able to do that that's just getting in the game like a first-time South entrepreneur? Central, nobody, who, 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 nobody has that kind of money yeah. saved in, in, in our communities, you know. In order to save 100000 you got to be making a couple million dollars. Yeah. Or I've been doing that for a while. And, and you know, in our communities have suffered the worst from the whole thing. So, um we had to go in, man, and fight for the social equity, uh, which we're doing right now. Uh, I'm working with an um, organization called Indica, mm-hmm. and we've been pushing, you know, we want the city to waive the fees for yeah. for uh, 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 black and brown people because who grew up I in South Central. Because I sit back and I think, like, how many people are locked up right now for marijuana for some bullshit, but they got a mind like yours. Absolutely. And absolutely. they have just the, the, the natural never had knack the for entrepreneurship. Never, exactly. Never had the opportunity exactly. to. I mean, what what do you expect for a kid to do if he can't uh, uh, exercise his entrepreneurship right. in no other way? When you can get in a drug business with 50 bucks. Psh. Some places, probably 25 bucks. You you can become an illegal drug dealer for 25, 30 bucks, you know, and and. and if you're a real entrepreneur, you are looking for some kind of way to 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 show your skills. Let me ask you this. This is going to be my last, uh, like, uh, I guess you can call it a fuckboy question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you good. But I got to know this. You I got to know this, good. man. Because it's like not every day we get to talk to you. So in the 80s, when you're selling cocaine, what was that markup like? Like, what was that profit? How much were you buying for and how much were you selling for? Well, it, at different times, uh, uh, it was different prices. When I first started, I was getting an eight track. I was paying like uh, what's eight, the, three grams. What's eight track. It's three grams. That's what we call it. Okay, track. that's not three, that much. No, no, very small. I would pay, and it had cut on it too, so it really was about a gram of cocaine. But I would pay three fifty for that, and I could take that and turn it into nine hundred. But Damn, what happens as you as you go up in the food chain, mm-hmm. you start to make less. Say for instance, when I bought my first kilo of cocaine, I was able to make two hundred thousand off of it. Woo. But once I started buying, wait, how much does a kilo go for? Or did it go for back then? Back then, like forty five, fifty thousand. Damn, that's expensive. But this exactly. was a rich man drug, though. It was a rich man. Um, people in Hollywood, only people were doing it at that time. It was people had money. But as you start to buy fifty and a hundred kilos then you might only be making 10,000 15,000 but the difference is is that you would do that in you might sell 50 in mm-hmm. one day so that becomes yeah. 500,000 at profit. scale pretty much so you sound like Gary Vaynerchuk right now like <laughs> so 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 that was a different in uh, uh the price you wasn't doubling your money or nothing like that but you still made great money you know at, at my heyday um you know we were doing like 100 to 200 keys a day <laughs> and Sheesh. Uh, you know, we making anywhere from twenty five hundred to five thousand off of each one, so so that's how we was rolling. Damn! So I see how that's three million, man. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. All yeah. right, so let's talk about this book that sold out. Uh, when are you gonna re up on the book? The Twenty One Keys, by uh, the way. The Twenty One Keys, man. That book, that book came about. Me and me and my partner, we was not planning on doing that book. Um, when I first got out of prison, my first six months out of prison, I'm just riding around trying to get stuff done, trying to uh, break back into society. Mm-hmm. And uh, while I was in prison, I taught myself to read and write. You know, you know, I found the issue that got myself out of prison. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, I'm the one that got myself out of prison. My lawyer. How did that happen? Hold on. I turned into a lawyer in there, man. I had to learn how to read and write. You know, I went in illiterate, but I didn't come out illiterate. So, hold on. Quick side note. Now, you taught yourself all that, and it's like you had some tools that most people just take for granted, knowing how to read and write. And then it's like when you learned how to do that, a whole new world opened up to you and oh, looked absolutely. what you learned and what you taught yourself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, mean, I mean, the things that I'm doing right now is because of me being able to read and write, mm-hmm. and I read books that line like everybody I, I, I was asking you earlier did you read my, my obituary no and I don't even know what you meant when you said that like they wrote, you they wrote my obituary in, in LA Magazine they did my obituary 
What did it say? Or what? Explain to me the situation. Well, it talks about L.A.'s most famous drug man is doing life. I'm riding uh, down the, the 101, headed to Lompoc, where Razor Wire meet Gun Towers, and to see Freeway Rick Ross. Mm-hmm. And it talks about where I grew up at in South Central L.A., and I was illiterate. Uh, talks about my car club. I mean, you know, this L.A. Times, they know me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so they basically just laid out my whole my whole thing, and, and uh, they talked about how I was going to die in prison. Wow, and you're seeing this. I'm hearing it. I'm talking to the guy. Damn. And, and I'm telling him, like, no, 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 no. You know, I'm, I'm going to be telling the politicians what to do. I'm going to be telling the preachers. I'm going to have a heavyweight champ of the world. I'm going to be doing music. I I got a book that's going to come out. I got a documentary that's coming. I got a movie that's coming. I got a lot of life left. I ain't dead yet. Right. And uh, it was crazy when I got out and me and him was riding in the car together. Mm -hmm. The guy named Jesse Katz. He's on the documentary, too. When you hear the documentary... You the one hear, on Netflix right now. It's on Netflix. You know, I got the no one documentary hey, on Netflix. Hey, talk one that year. shit. <laughs> <laughs> so in the beginning of the documentary, that's me and Jesse talking when I was in prison. He oh. recorded the conversation, which is one of the things Gary said. He said, it's always good when you're recording because that way you can always prove what was being said. And, and uh, in, that, in that conversation, I told him that I would be doing these things, you know, uh, like I just focus on the biggest colleges in this country. Yeah. You know, Brown, uh, St. John, Stanford, UCLA, USC. Uh, you, you know, I done got around a little bit. And the things that I was telling him in that interview that I was going to be doing when he called himself write my mm-hmm. obituary uh, is all right there. And it's just, it's just amazing to, uh, to now be sitting here, you know. Yeah, man. You, well, I mean, you put the work behind it, but you definitely spoke it into existence. Yeah, you have to. And, and that, that was something else that I learned from from my experience, right? See, when I left out the movie that day, the theater that day, and 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 I had planned in my mind that I wanted to be Superfly, and I became that. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- what I didn't understand, and, and and is that when you visualize those things, and 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 they come to you, like I knew I was going to prison before I'd ever been in a police car. You know, I used to ask my girls, uh, "What you gonna do when I go to jail? Are you gonna run?" And and when I was sitting in prison, I was like. Why would you be asking somebody that? Right. And you ain't never been in handcuffs. So while I was sitting there, I started to say, well, why don't you tell yourself you're going to get out? And and that's what I started to do because I understood that the law of attraction that we bring to us, that that we really want and not what we think we want. So I had to really make up my mind that I really wanted to be out of prison. And that's what I did. You lived a crazy life, man. (laughs) One one more thing I wanted to ask you about because you brought it up before the camera started rolling is uh, you told me. Cause we're all in this room like big DMX fans. Oh, that's and my this man. conversation. That's my man. DMX this conversation ran a little before we started shooting. I'm you coming, told me you got man. a DMX story. Oh man, I was in Miami when I first got home. I had I probably had been home about a month, and and I never met X. And I go to the club. You know they got the billboard uh-huh. up. Well, DMX. what what year are we talking? Like what time frame? Like. We talking like late nineties, early two thousand nine, two thousand nine. Okay. Like right when I got home, I okay. just I just got home. You know, my my PO let me travel as soon as I got out. <laughs> That's why they got her off my case. She didn't stay on my case long. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm in Miami, man, and and uh, I got on my shorts and and we walking down South Beach, and my man was like, "Man, DMX is right there." I was like, "Man, I would love to see my man X." And uh, we go up to the door, and we was like, "Man, tell X Freeway Rick is out." outside and uh the man said oh y'all can't come in you got on shorts and you got on uh flip-flops so i said all right we'll just tell x i'm out here man x came out man <laughs> x came out and then the owner was like uh x uh you got to go back in and perform and and uh we ain't letting them in x a you don't let him in i ain't going in oh! <laughs> said, hey, yo, dog. Man, he was Bro. finna give up he was finna give up his check let man. my man in he said he was gonna give up his check man dude had to let me in damn x wasn't gonna perform it was like performing time man and he came out there he said right on the step and talked to me oh gee i love you man <laughs> <laughs> you my man Freeway with you rock <laughs> you my dog for life it was crazy <laughs> it was crazy that 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 he showed that kind of love man and uh you know, I got I got mad love for one man. Damn, welcome man. home, X. Yeah, welcome home, X. We need that album, man. Yeah. I mean, get well though. Get well. That's most important before the music. But yeah, I, 
I'll be looking forward to a DMX album. Yeah, yeah, man. That's my man, man. I got mad love for him. Ain't no ain't no Hollywood on him at all. At all. What you see is what you get, like it or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man, uh, anything else you want to plug? I appreciate you coming through. Man, this I got my man like... here, man. I got I got the hottest artists, man. Because you're getting into music we, now, right? Yeah, yeah. We just killed Atlanta, man. Super Bowl weekend. Y'all better check it out. We killed Atlanta, man. He hit, he hit like 10 clubs. We just walk in, take the microphone. Everyone was lit. Everyone yeah, was let lit. Let the people know what your name is, man. What's up? What's up, man? It's your boy Naku, East Coast to the West Coast. Whoa, whoa, whoa! <laughs> oh, he hit him with it. <laughs> oh shit! I wasn't expecting that right now. Yeah, yeah. Naku, get out, man. That's he, the ladies. He, 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 he's one of those artists that he don't care where he at. Mm-hmm. I mean, he just love to sing. I mean, we we've been on street corners and everything. He just he just <laughs> break down right there on the spot. How'd you man. how'd you hook up with this guy? And it's a crazy story, yo, because, like, I just started coming to Cali within, like, the last year. And when I came out here, I ain't know nobody, right? Where you from? I'm from York, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. It's the central area of Pennsylvania and stuff. And, like I said, I ain't know nobody out here, so I came out here on faith. And then my when, before I came out here, my cousin, was, he said that he had his friend that was out here, so he that was a spot for me to stay. Right. So I came out here, I ain't know nobody. And then I see my man's Hayes was just sitting to the left of me. What up, Hayes? I, I had him on Facebook. I had him on Facebook, and I seen he was out here. I was so that was like one person. I was like, oh yeah, let me link up with him. Right. And then I found out what he was doing and stuff, and he knew that I was doing music, and he was rocking with me. So he was like, yo, I'm gonna put you on the show. And then I was like, well, let's get it. So I go to the show. I ain't even know Freeway Rick Ross was gonna be there. So when I seen him, I was like, oh yeah, I gotta turn up. <laughs> it's the time. You know yeah. What I mean? So ever since that show, he just been rocking with me ever since. And then what you say when you saw him perform, you were just like, "This kid got it." Well, I saw him perform and I, I liked him, but I, I mean, I, I done had a few artists that I work with, and, and you get mm-hmm. them hot, and and then you know they go and sign with somebody else, or or you can't get them where they want to go. So right. I, I wanted to know his loyalty. You know, was you going because you know you can have the contracts and all that, but if it ain't no no friendship in there, I I don't need it. Right. You know, I don't need it just you know just because to make some money or something like that. There, I, I I want more of like. Man, let's do something meaningful that's, that's, that's going to be meaningful to everybody. Mm-hmm. So um, it took me a few more times to hang out with him and talk to him. Me and him had a long talk one night. Yeah. We was riding together. We went by a couple of my boys in the studio, Jay Worthy and, uh, uh, you know, Jay. You know Jay Worthy? <laughs> yeah, what yeah. What up, Jay Worthy? We, we went by the studio, and, and a few of the guys was there, and, and they all told him, like, Man, to be rocking with Rick, man, you know Rick going to keep it 100. Yeah. He ain't playing yeah. no games, you know, because all the basically – they was like, I'll rock with Rick if he say, well, let's rock right now, you know. So he got to see that, and and, and me and him uh, just figured that that we mm-hmm. we we could make a good team, and and um, I think he the right one for me. That's what's and up, it's man. More than team now, like this this short amount of time that we've been rocking with each other, we we like family now. He's like right. my real uncle now. Right. So and it's a blessing for me. And yeah, we killed we kill too, Miami man. too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my birthday weekend! They had a birthday party for me in, in Miami. We, we uh, we find out you're still in there, out there in Miami, <laughs> getting <it> popping. <laughs> yeah. well, we've been, we've been, we've been on. We just left Detroit yesterday. Mm-hmm. I mean, we yeah. just flew in. Yeah, yesterday we flew in from Detroit. They didn't want us to go either. They can you stay one more day. <laughs> well, wait. So you sing, right? Yeah. I sing. Can you sing, sing, or you just kind of sing? I be singing. I sing. I sing a lot. Man, we so think, if we if think we, he. If we walked Paulina over there right now, could you sing to her just a couple bars? Just a couple bars. Yeah, of course. Paulina. <laughs> shout out to Paulina. Come on, Paulina. Hey, hey Paulina, come Mr. On. Mina. Um, come on over here. Let him, let him get we, you some. We stay sacrificing her to artists when they come in. Uh, last week, she had to show Red Man Her Feet. <laughs> but today, you're cool, right? You're cool? Yes, sir. Not here, you cool. got it in the camera. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Here we go. You finna get it. You finna get cool. it. You finna get all this. All this. You gotta keep the mic next to you. This is this is just so you know that uh I am single. <laughs> oh, see that's another thing. That's what I heard, you know what I mean? <laughs> her and the ladies, just to let y'all know. Damn, he just hit you with two bars, and Paulina's already feeling some type of way. Yeah, Give it a day. Shout out. That's, shout that's out. a. You can't teach that. That's yeah, a natural so, talent. So we got here in the studio right now with some of the top producers. In the, yeah, in the... I just um we just got done a couple songs. I got my single back from Brian Kennedy. Um, he's a big industry producer. He produced mm-hmm. uh Chris Brown Forever, Rihanna Disturbia, Usher Love in This Club. Like he he's been going off. This single about to go crazy. 
And Talk also, he was in the studio last week with our own Jizzle. Mm-hmm, Jizzle. Oh, Jizzle's a homie? I like that name, though. That just sounds, <laughs> that just sounds like, what's up, Jizzle? Yeah, yeah. So we was in the studio with her. We, we uh... We, we we work in the industry. We we finna do right. a, a, a little small tour down south. We're gonna go to the Carolinas. Uh uh I think Duchess. We're gonna be down there with Duchess. So we're gonna hit uh Charlotte and Fayville and Dorley Rum and Greenboro. We 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 just you know, we just man making our mm-hmm. moves, man, without a deal. Deb, how is the music game like the drug game? It's identical, man, if you if you learn how to get it out the streets, you know, uh I, I enjoy getting mine out of the street. You know, if you if you working with a company, you know they give you the big lump sums. You know, a couple hundred thousand, the loan, thousand, yeah, which is loan. really slavery. But that's but, a whole but other. When you get it the way we getting it right now, you know, it's like it, it's small money. You know, a couple hundred here, a couple hundred there, but it's all yours, and it just keep coming forever. And 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 we building up that that foundation that uh, nobody will be able to take away from us. You know, that's what's up. All right, my last question is this. Somebody's watching this right now. Somebody's hearing this on the radio right now. They're in the game. D-Boy. They got a little bit of change, but they're, but they're like you. When you knew you had to make the change, you were like, I got to get out the game. So somebody watching this right now that's in the game but wants to get out, what do they do to get out the game successfully? Well, well the first thing you have to do is you have to start to educate yourself. You know, it, it's, it's, it's crazy that we uh, do things without having any knowledge, really, of what, uh, what we're doing. Right. And the reason that I found out that I was so successful inside of the drug business is because I studied the business. Uh, while I was in prison, a lot of young guys would come up to me and they would be like, well, Rick, what makes you so special? Why was you able to make a million dollars a day and, and I couldn't make a thousand dollars over my career? And, you know, what I had to tell them is that they didn't take the time to analyze the, the business uh, aspect of it. They were just doing what they saw everybody else doing. And most mm-hmm. of the time, as soon as they would make two hundred dollars, they'd go out and buy a pair of tennis shoes and, you know, a watch, and 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 they would be broke all over again. Well, with me, uh, I passed on the watches and the and the cars and the clothes, and and I stuck my money, and that gave me buying power where I could go to the man and say, you know, hey, I got a hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars. Let's let's talk business mm-hmm. until the point where I would go with three million dollars, and I would be like, well, let's talk business. Because you know, a guy with three million dollars is gonna get a better deal than a right, guy with yeah. with with a thousand dollars. So that that's basically what's the difference in in me and and most other guys that's trying to be in the drug business. Right. Well, that's what it is, man. Freeway Ricky Ross. Thank you so much, man. L.A. native. Hey, yeah, You're always all the welcome. Way, all man. the way. Come all back, the way. man. When you for whatever when okay, the movie well, comes well, you out. Know, whatever. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be doing a cast in here in L.A. in in a couple in a couple months for the movie. So we, we're going to have open cash. You know, we, we're going to do it on the street so everybody can get a chance. Yeah. Also, if you want to follow me, text me at F Freeway uh, 310-340-1930. Damn, you steal the plug. Me. Say the number one more time. <laughs> 310-340-1930. That's how you can get at me. You want to find out what's going on about the casting calls, about anything. If you're an artist, you want to get at me about... Uh, getting with me because I'm back in the game now. Naku going to need some help. Mm-hmm. We ain't going to send him out there on the tour by itself. We're going we gonna to build our own crew up so that uh, when he go out, we go out together. Yeah, that psh. Tell him your social media. Oh, uh, they can hit me up on social media at Freeway Ricky on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook uh, is Freeway Rick Ross. That's what it is, man. Freeway Ricky Ross, 935 KD 90s hip-hop back in the day. Peace.